Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Perky Pet Podcast Series. Today's show is the first of three-part series on one of my favorites, the hummingbird. Special thanks to Perky Pet for bringing the series to you. To learn more about their vast selection of bird feeders and bird feeding products, please visit their website at www.perkypet.com. I'm Susan Matson, and on behalf of Perky Pet, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ross Hawkins to the show. Ross is the founder and director of the Hummingbird Society, which was created to educate people about the hummingbirds and protect these birds from extinction. During today's conversation, Ross will share with us some fascinating insights on the hummingbird migration. Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you, Susan. I love hummingbirds, and so much about these tiny, charismatic birds is just amazing. But to me, the most amazing is their ability to migrate such great distances. Now, we think of them as fragile, but they really aren't. Any bird that can migrate 3,000 miles each way and come back the next year and repeat this for four or five years is anything but fragile. I probably should say that not all hummingbirds in the United States migrate, but about two-thirds of them do. The longest migrating hummingbird is the rufous. It can be found as far north as Anchorage, Alaska, and yet it migrates to southern Mexico, and that's a total distance of about 3,000 miles each way. That's a long distance for a little bird that's only three inches long. Recently, they banded a bird in Tallahassee, Florida, and they recaptured it about five months later near Anchorage. And that was 3,500 miles, and to my knowledge, that's the longest distance any hummingbird has ever been doc- documented to migrate. My goodness. Interestingly, they don't migrate the same path. When they go south, most of them go down through the Rockies because there's lots of wildflowers in the late summer. But in the spring, when there are no wildflowers, they go up through California. And as nearly as we can tell, we have evidence that they memorize the location of every single food source on that entire 6,000-mile loop, which could be your feeder in your backyard or it might be your flowers in the front yard. People in the eastern United States are very familiar with the ruby throat and its long-distance migration. It starts from points as far north as Nova Scotia and can be found in the winter as far south as Panama, although we don't have a documentation of one particular bird that did that. And as if that isn't enough, when the hummingbird gets down to the Gulf of Mexico, it fattens up and then flies nonstop from the Gulf Coast all the way over to the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, there's no place to stop on a trip like that, except maybe a shrimp boat or an oil drilling platform, and we have had some stories of that. But just imagine a little tiny bird flying for 20 hours, a distance of 600 miles across the Gulf of Mexico, knowing full well that he'd better not run into a headwind or a storm. And yet they've done this for thousands of years. People have asked me, how can they possibly migrate such great distances? And I tell them it's because they're smart. They add extra fuel before they leave. We all know that they eat nectar, but what a lot of people may not know is that these hummingbirds, before migrating, convert this nectar into fat. Now, I tell people that's why I look the way I do. I'm getting ready for a long trip. But for the hummingbird, it's essential. (laughs) Well, they don't believe me. For the hummingbird, they'll pick up as much as 30% of their body weight as fat reserves. Now, that's a lot like the wingtip fuel tanks on an airplane that increases the range and gives it a cushion against unexpected results. You know, Susan, one of the most common myths about hummingbird migration is that if we don't take down our feeders, the hummingbirds won't migrate. The myth of that is that the hummingbird migrates when the number of daylight hours shrinks to a number that triggers a chemical reaction in its brain and says, hey, it's time to get moving. And that means no matter how many flowers in your yard, no matter how many feeders you're keeping maintained, when the hummingbird's inner signal tells them it's time to leave, nothing that you do in the way of keeping your feeders up will detract him from it. And in fact, you know, it's kind of crazy because if you take your feeder down, you'd have to convince all your neighbors to take theirs down. You'd have to convince the local botanical garden to cut down all their hummingbird flowers because you wouldn't want them to hold the bird back. So no, we don't have to worry about our feeders keeping them from migrating. 
In my experience, these birds migrate a distance till they find a good food source, stop, replace their fat reserves by spending several days at the garden or feeders, and repeat that. Now, I mentioned that the hummingbirds often add 30% to their fat reserves. The ruby throat is different from that because he adds 100% to his body weight. And that's what it takes to get the bird across the Gulf of Mexico, a 100% increase in body weight. You can see why I think migration is just one of the most fascinating aspects about hummingbirds. It surely is. So when when the birds come back year after year and they really need these refilling moments, uh, and it sounds like they count on them, obviously, and they pay attention to where they can refuel, is there anything, any type of feeder or any place that you would think to say, you know, this is a good one to have or a good a good place to put it? Well, Susan, there are so many to choose from. The Perky Pat 8-ounce pinch waist glass feeder is a good example of this. I should say that you'll have more success with three small feeders than one large feeder because this reduces the ability of an aggressive bird to keep the others from feeding. We like to hang several of the little beginner feeders in open trees or shrubs tucked away in a little bit where females in particular can slip in, feed, and go back to their nest and babies without being detected. Wonderful. I, I thought we had a conversation earlier about um, some of some of the hummingbirds maybe not migrating as much or at all. Is there any... Tra- well, there is. There's uh, new information gained in the last, oh, I'd say 10 or 15 years that an increasing number of birds are not migrating to the places they used to. The rufus, for example, usually spends its summer, its uh, sorry, its winters in southern Mexico. But more and more of them have been detected in the southeast United States, from Louisiana all the way over to Florida. And by banding these birds, we find that the same birds are returning every year. It's so they've decided that the climate is mild enough in the south that there's no need to go further. And not only is the rufus doing that, but as many as nine or ten other species are doing it. The ruby throat doesn't seem to want to spend the winter there, and by tradition it migrates all the way across into Central America. But these other species uh, are amazing in that they're being found in places that are not their normal breeding grounds. I know one day an individual found eight hummingbird species in Louisiana in a single day. Another individual told me he found a total of... 10 species in Alabama in a single winter. So you don't have to leave you don't have to leave the country in some instances. You just have to travel south <laughs> with them. <laughs> that's right. You have to, if you just know where they're going, that's all you have to do and that's sort of nice, isn't it, to think that you could spend your winter down on the coast of Georgia, say, and see hummingbirds there that you've never seen before. Absolutely. It gives all new meaning to the word snowbirds. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doesn't it though? <laughs> Thank you so much, Ross, for such an enlightening conversation. Hummingbirds, you know, they really are amazing, especially when it comes to that migration. You know, for more information, folks, about hummingbirds or to learn about perky pets and the products that you heard today, please visit www.perkypet.com. And to learn more about Dr. Ross Hawkins' work in the Hummingbird Society, please visit their website at www.hummingbirdsociety.com. Thanks for listening, and watch for an announcement of our next conversation with Ross, in which we'll discuss the hummingbird's feeding habits.